Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to the Thinking on Paper book club. Chapter seven this week of the Nexus, augmented thinking for a complex world, the new convergence of art, technology and science by Julio Latino with Bruce Mao. Um, chapter seven, my favorite chapter of the book, I will say. Ooh, Jeremy, that's a big I, statement. It's a big statement. It's a big statement. It's my favorite chapter. It's my favorite chapter because essentially chapter seven breaks down creativity. Um, it, what makes a creative person? And obviously if you're building your dream team, you want creatives in there, left brain, right brain, but you want creative people in there. Um, the chapter, it's so many incredible references. You got Picasso, Van Gogh, Munch, Marguerite, Edison, Tesla, Russell, Rodin, Twain, Hitchcock. I mean, the list goes on of examples that he uses and why these particular people were so creative. Um, I'll start with a quote from Herbert Simon, which I think I'm stealing because you were going to use this in the last episode and I'm using it. To this is one of my favorites. This is Herbert Simon. Actually, yeah, this is a good one. Fire yeah. away. Well, maybe you know it off by art. In his 1983 PNAS, which is, um, what's that mean? PNAS, it's an, <laughs> <laughs> the Nobel Prize in economics. Um, he said, creative individuals possess, one, a willingness to accept vaguely defined problem statements and gradually structure them. Two, a continual preoccupation with problems over considerable periods of time. And three, extensive background knowledge in relevant and potentially relevant areas. So here's why this here's why this is interesting to me. So I, I ran across this or a version of this a long time ago in in another book called A Technique for Producing Ideas uh, from James Webb Young. And he talks he was an Ogilvy guy, like early, early, like Mad Men, like original advertising dude in the 50s or whatever. And a lot of this, like a lot of this comes out in, in what he said about creativity a long time ago. And there's just to, to paraphrase, there's this idea of like being okay, living in the messy middle, right? The messy middle of something that we don't know what, the, we don't even know what the problem is that we're thinking about. It's just an area that sparks our curiosity. Right. So I feel that way. Like, I feel like I can figure out or, or I can figure out where my curiosity is lit and kind of go to those places, even though I don't know why I'm doing it or what the outcome is going to be. So I think that is, that's important to think about. I think a continual preoccupation, right? So this is interesting. This is, um, this is, uh, this is an extension of like living with, once that problem is identified, living in that space of not being able to have the answer, right? And not getting frustrated with not having the answer. Uh, so extended, living in that unknowing um, is pretty powerful, but like tucking it away in your subconscious a little bit and just letting it live there and connect dots as you, as you bring in new information. Right. Nice. Um, yeah. I, I like, what do you think of the potentially relevant? I think that's quite a key word in that, isn't it? The potentially relevant areas. Um, okay. I don't know how I'm going to try to do this, but maybe you could look through some of the rules of creativity or what he thinks of the rules of creativity are and how they might apply in the business world. So maybe a marketing yeah. brand manager, maybe. So the first one is like learn the craft and then set it aside. Um, and he uses some artwork that, you know, you start here with the the rules, the basics, you know, trying to get in the groundwork. If you're an artist, if you can't, if you're listening to this, it's a picture of a man. Um, and then once you've learned that, deconstruct it, simplify it, break the rules, move away from the guidelines that got you your introduction to that and end up with just that. Wait, Obviously, so is, there's wait, context is, behind it. But. Is reductionism coming into play in creativity now? I mean, if you just looked at it, that does look like reductionism, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, how about the one from Picasso then? Uh, yeah, let's look at the one from Picasso, see if that is reductionism as well with the cow, his famous cow, where he starts with this and ends up here. Oh, this mirrored camera is playing havoc with my pointing. Um yeah, I think I think so going going back to the um 
Going back to the creativity piece that you mentioned, referenced that first artist who started in one place and kind of went down to the black square, you know, learn the rules, learn the craft and then break the rules. Right. So it's, it's kind of like, it's again, surprising Jeremy comes with another music reference, but you know, in order to like understand guitar, you play the songs you want to learn on guitar, or the songs you like on guitar, and then you pick how those incorporate into the rules of music. Right. And then once you become comfortable and proficient at doing those things, then you push the boundaries, right? Because you know the boundaries that can be pushed by learning it. I think that that's what I take away from that that first piece of it, learn it and then break the rules. Yeah, I think it's a good analogy for the, the guitar. If you, you I, For me personally, if you like learn a song and then play it how you want, but learn how to play it. That's what Hendrix did, isn't it? And he just, just break the rules all over the shop. Um, another reason why this is my favorite chapter of the book is Frank Lloyd Wright and the story of falling water and creativity and constraints. And Julio says, you know, if you have constraints, constraints can help your creativity. Deadlines are an obvious example. And you know, people say, oh, no, I don't work in constraints. I need time. I need, you know, to think about it. And the story of Falling Water is incredible because basically Frank Lloyd Wright was commissioned to build this millionaire's house and he spent nine months doing nothing. And then one Saturday morning, the guy called him and said, I'm going to be there in a couple of hours to see the designs. And Frank Lloyd Wright hadn't done anything. And he just, and, you know, he had his breakfast and literally like the best all-time work of American architecture voted for by architects was done in two hours after breakfast because he was in a rush, which I found, I just find the whole story so incredible. Well, I think, I think good inputs equal good outputs, right? And, and I think about this in, you know, while he may not have been putting pen to paper and actually drawing anything, he is certainly, you know, intaking a bunch of information not related to that project even specifically. Maybe he was reading an amazing fiction story. You know, maybe he was learning about, um, you know, the method uh, to, to draw and shade an apple or whatever the heck it is, right? But somehow all of those things connected when the constraint was there to say, hey, you got to pull something off right now, right? Wouldn't it be funny if he'd just been reading some Pulp Fiction, science fiction comic, which just happened to have, I don't know, water, pouring out of a UFO or something. And they just, ah, that, boom, got it. <laughs> highly, highly possible. So bringing it back to the brand world, right? Cause there's a lot of people who read, um, in order to, you know, as, as Julio Atino talks about augment their thinking, right. To improve yeah. their craft, to translate it to better results as an individual and the, the group they run in their company. Right. So how is it possible for a company to allow this room to breathe? Um, because I think room to breathe and space to consider uh, things and and have good inputs stew around in your subconscious. Because I think there's a subconscious processing that happens with creativity. But brands are like businesses are like, hey, P and L, I've got a shareholder call tomorrow. What have we done, <laughs> you know, to to show value? Right? How do companies balance that? Like according to what we've been reading in this book, like what are some of the principles can we pull out? Well, listen to Luz Donahue in uh Ooh, yeah, episode with her, who speaks exactly about this, about brands and companies finding space for their employees, for their teams to 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 breathe, to think, to create, and creativity without constraints as well. It's like okay, I mean, you're the expert on Bell Labs, but essentially, just Bell Labs were given time and space, so we know we know it works. We know that if you're given space and you're given time to be creative, you can produce great things. So how do brands and companies, I mean, it takes a nexus thing. It takes leadership. It takes courage and guts to, you know, to say to whoever it is, you know, okay, take the week and go mad. I mean, the harsh reality in this world is that not many companies and not many brands are going to do that. No matter what lessons, no matter how many times they're told that it works just because, they're working on immediate returns, aren't they? So maybe changing the the outlook of immediate returns, a lot like long term. I don't know how you would do that. So what's your? How would you do it using these rules? What's you know some nexus thinking? You're a nexus thinker, Jeremy. You're going into 
X doesn't have to be X, but you know, X as in X brand. How are you going to implement? I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it for X. By I the don't way. mean X, but yeah. like, yeah, <laughs> X brand. How, how would you do it? Yeah, I think I think what what can be quantified. People are um, businesses are always looking to understand uh, quantification of results to turn it into data to show that something is happening in progress. Right, is the way I think about it. So, what can be quantified in the early stage of ideation and exploration is the fact that you are just holding space to 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 identify and explore. Right. So the first thing would be like. Hey, for the next three weeks, Mark, I want you and your team on Mondays between eight and noon. Uh, I want you to do nothing but explore a list of uh, of things that drive your curiosity, that literally drive your curiosity. And even maybe prior to that, having them build a list of things they love to listen to, they love to read, they love to explore, they wish they would have done, right? And then you can quantify those moments over the next three weeks. And then you can have an output and have a discussion and say, hey, what are some of the cool things that could come out of that? Um, but I think the early quantification of just dedicating the time. I love that. Actionable. And also, you're obviously a better Nexus think than I am because I said a week or a month. You said a few hours. And a few hours on a Monday morning, start the week with some ideation, some creativity, some freeform business brand jazz. You know, set you up for the week and get some ideas. Yeah. Short easily implementable ideas yeah yeah and then that could turn into a whole skunk works team over time or a bell labs yeah. team over time right but yeah. one, one thing so this goes back to the thread of converging don't converge too quickly right don't think you found the answer we referenced this in the last chapter it still is in this chapter as well but there was a quote in here that i found really interesting that that says can we take drastic action when something appears finished so yes. like yes been, you can Absolutely. Yeah. So when you write something, Mark, like when you, when you've spent weeks writing the lore for a video game that, um, that, you know, that, that you've turned over and you're ready to turn over, have you ever gotten to the point where you're just like, man, what if I just flip this character completely on its head? He's not a nice guy. He's an asshole now. What does that do to the rest of the story? Have you ever done that? It's hard to do, right? I'll tell you with writing, um, articles and blog posts and thought pieces is just get a really callous editor and they do it for you they do it for you <laughs> so it's like okay no mark this is all i want you to just gonna no no it's, we'll start at the end and begin in the mid and middle and you know take out half of it start again so yeah that that's the advice if you want to do that so that, <laughs> that's cheat that's cheating to achieve that's complementarity cheating. though right because <laughs> if you have complementarity you're doing it yourself but it's nice to have a nudge even though the nudge hurts sometimes right I think with, I mean, I, I'm not the person, we need to get B. Earl on or somebody to talk about, you know, th these big creative writers. But as the journey, as your story develops, your ideas are going to change. And then you're going to be forced to change big parts at the end just because of how the story has evolved and how the characters have evolved. That they dictate that, okay, now you need to make some changes. Like the beginning doesn't make sense because at the end they're doing this. And I'm sure there must be some some process of that for almost every creative writer um <coughs> yeah what about that what about, what about music do you ever do that do you ever just rip it up and start again oh absolutely yeah i so i i use constraints when i'm writing music just for myself too i'm not writing it to you know go on tour or sell records or anything i'm just writing it to 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 exercise the music muscle right so i i, I do these 90 minute song sprints where um you know i just start and largely you know they're they're electronic instruments sometimes a guitar or a bass and i'll spend 90 minutes on it and then i'll get out of it i'll just be like Psh. you know that's the rule 90 minutes quit messing with it and then i have a bunch of them in there that i'll go back to and i'll be like hey i'm gonna i'm gonna take the beat and completely flip this around and, and do things differently and it's easier to do that once you have the initial capture of something so absolutely i i, I do that and it's it's pretty fun I'm going to take what you just said and try to weave it into page 249 in, in the Nexus. Um, one of the creativity guidelines, be conscious of the judgment of the times. So I'm going to say this one because you and I, I listened to Rick Rubin the other day and he was interviewing Trent Reznor. Now, Rick Rubin is relevant here because in his book, Creativity, he speaks about this, you know, right for the times. You're going to write something and it's going to be right for that time. 
and times are going to move on and what you created for that time is no longer relevant or important or it's lost it, some of its charm because the times have changed which is what he speaks about here but and Trent Reznor speaks about the same thing but Trent Reznor also speaks about what you just did a few probably about a long time ago now he did an experiment where every day he'd create a new piece of music based on an, a photograph or a quote or something and at the end of the day that was it it was over he had a day per song and what he created in that time that was it and it went out into the world and good or bad things happened well you know what's really interesting creativity is i look at it a couple of ways number one it um when you make something it's it's something captured in a moment in time whether it's a photograph whether it's trent reznor's song whether it's something that you write whether it's a journal page that i write it's it's a capture of what was happening right at that moment in time right so if you think about that as being an object okay whatever that thing is captured creativity in general is like this unique rearrangement of found things right like chord progressions it's you know a one four five in in c is still a one four five in c but there are millions of songs that are written in in that form right so taking these song bits that i've had and using them as new objects to create something entirely new it's really interesting when you start capturing stuff you can connect it in new ways as new jump off points too i like it um shall we how would you summarize chapter seven jeremy how would you summarize it from a creativity perspective and from a a, a brand somebody who, if a brand's working how what can they take from this chapter i think there's an interesting accessibility to the creative process as as he's out as he as he's outlined it especially nice. especially for people that don't there are so many people that are like man i don't have a creative bone in my body i'm like i call the biggest you know bullshit on that because like all of us are innately creative right and the narratives that we have in our head are you know well i'm not good at creating you don't have to be good at it you just have to do it right so seeing this framework in here maybe someone that has that mindset of you know i'm not creative they can look at this and be like well you know maybe i am creative because i've done this and i've done that and maybe if i can and take a look at some things like for example one of the 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 one of the framework pieces right before be conscious of judgment of the times is be ready to prepare the ground and i think that is like that's one of the coolest ones here where someone someone looking at this can say well hey i had a great new idea and my business didn't like it and then it's like okay well of that great idea because i've done this a million times not a million times but i've done this a lot come up with like harebrained really inventive interesting ideas and pitch them to somebody with such excitement that i've scared the shit out of them related to the idea right so preparing the ground is like okay well what if that person creating those ideas can think about how it connects to existing thinking i think that is such an important piece because um if you can frame it in the existing way of doing things then the light starts to turn on over time but it takes time so anyway long story short long, long answer to your question this is a great peek at, at the creative process for those who don't think they're creative i love it absolutely love it that's just you've just perfectly distilled chapter seven of the nexus so nice work jeremy um that's the end of book club for today we'll be back for chapter eight um next week check out thinkingonpaper.xyz xyz xyz for more show notes and a request if you like what you're listening to tell a friend get involved and share the book club Stay see you next club. time guys bye